Lindsay Sutcliffe Memorial Lecture. This is to commemorate a student who was very dear to us, who died in a car accident a couple of years ago, but who, who who's, uh, was very concerned with the issues of peace and social justice. And it's on this theme that we've built these memorial lectures. And I can't think of, of anyone who, uh, who, who signifies and has worked towards these goals um, uh, that uh, in, in anyone we can think of really than Professor Stafford Beer, who is, who is with us this evening, to share his thoughts with us. Um, as you can see from the format of, of this, this, uh, this uh, arrangement, um, Stafford would prefer not to be speaking to us, but wishes to discuss with us and, and develop ideas with us on the theme, the will of the people. I, I honestly, I, as I was expecting Eric to introduce uh, Stafford, I didn't prepare anything, and I, I really honestly would not know where to begin. He's done so many things and contributed in so many ways to the development of, of, uh, of, of thought and, uh, and social organization and, and, and uh, uh, contributed really to uh, ideas in so many different fields that uh, it would be foolish to try to encapsulate that in, in just one or two sentences. Um, all I can do really is, is uh, say to, uh, that we are very grateful that he was able to find time to, to, to join us this evening to commemorate Lindsay Sutcliffe's uh, memory and um, turn over the, the discussion to him. Thank you very much, Stanley. Well, I'm very pleased to be with you. Uh, but I, I am serious about the format of this thing. <clears throat> See, if we restrict ourselves to lecturing, then we've got to know what we're talking about, and we have to uh, refine uh, a topic down to something which becomes quite trivial, usually. And I am very deeply concerned that because of this phenomenon, we never really address our minds to such a vast issue as I have calmly written <laughs> with my hand shaking as the title for us to look at tonight. Because where does one start and where does one finish and how can one say anything at all coherent? That hasn't already been said before, that doesn't seem to be the topic of a, of, of a, a very glossy Sunday supplement or one of those things. I want, to, if I can, to, to create an atmosphere in this room tonight where everybody is really personally wrestling with what on earth this means. The notion that we would like people to be able to express themselves in, in their own spirit, in the development of their society, and in every other conceivable way. We have only to say that, please note, to realize that most people in the world have no more hope of doing this than of jumping over the moon because the world exists in a state of tyranny. We then say for our own sake, as far as we are concerned, that we are extremely lucky because we live in a society which we presume to call free. And we say we are in a democracy, and that's very, that's very nice. But then, of course, I say it with, with uh, a lot of concentration of spirit. We know that this isn't true. We do have the ability to sit here and talk about it without, without any risk that people would march in and cart us off to jail. That's something. But maybe that's about all. It is very hard to defend the proposition that we actually live in a democracy. Government by the people. Demos classis. So what I'm saying is that if we, if we can attune our minds to, to really grappling with this, instead of saying, oh, this fellow turns out to be a Marxist or a non-Marxist or a neo-Marxist or something like that, then this is what I would like us to try and do, because I think those political categories have rather failed us. Um, 
the French, uh, I've already established, I can't remember names tonight, uh, I want the name of the French philosopher who, who recently died. Marcus. Playwright. Playwright. Sartre. Sartre. Sartre's critique, which is hard going, and I hope some of you have read it, read it, makes the point that um, there has been no coherent political theory other than Marxism in which to talk about these subjects so that automatically one gets grouped in sets of camps around this language. I would like to avoid that if we can. But we have to use some language. Now, if, if I were to say to you, right, well, now, if this is what we're going to try and do, we're going to try and grapple with this, and I'm not going to give a lecture because I don't know anything to lecture about, but I have thought a lot about these things, and I have done some, some things that I can tell you. Then what language should we be using? And would you come along with me and agree, just for the moment, to abandon those labels which get us into such... Uh, like sticky fly papers to which we just adhere and then we're st well, we've had it when we, when we get caught with those labels. Now, I, it turns out I am a systems man. <clears throat> I, I avoid labels even about what I am because, you see, as soon as I say I'm a systems man, some of you say, ha ha, that means computers, and other people say, ho ho, this means brains. And I say, no, he, he, it means neither or both of those things. But clearly what it means is that there is a body of knowledge that views the world systemically. So again, please avoid labels or you're going to misdirect yourselves. And I don't mean these are vis my speaking to you, but these are vis the subject matter that we have met to discuss. We don't want those labels. What we do want is a clear perception that we are dealing with a system and not with bits of systems which is what we are mostly invited to contemplate because it's more convenient you carve something up it is in our intellectual tradition to do so and develop a reductionist plan of campaign for thinking about anything we say well could, could consider this first consider this next but the model that i want to uh, to, to use with you, you will not obey that kind of law at all. It would be like taking apart a radio set and labeling all the parts and saying, well, we've got that organized. Now, which is the part that is actually Bing Crosby's voice? See? Or like a surgeon taking apart a body and saying, well, wh where is this man's indomitable will that we all know about? There are things that are the phenomena of systems that we never find by the reductionist approach. And I think that we have got most markedly entrapped as a result of trying to think about these things in that way. The second problem we face, if we, if we dare to write with trembling hand the will of the people, is, that, is the classic trap of trying to enumerate the world. You know, if we're going to make a nice tidy theory tonight about the will of the people, well, this is, this is bizarre, you can't do it. So how can we get in? Now, I'm trying to, I want to take you with me on a, on a voyage, and I have made a map of this voyage, which I will distribute to you in a minute, <coughs> when I've calmed you enough, I hope, not to be too alarmed by this map. The substance of things with which this approach to the mind deals is complexity. Now, you see, it's not money and it's not people as such. And I want to, to introduce you to the notion of complexity as a computable and handleable concept. Because that's what our world is made up of. And an awful lot, I think you probably agree with me straight away, avoiding all labels, that an awful lot of our problems result from the very thing that we were supposed to be gaining from as technology moved into the 20th century. The world was going to get smaller, everybody said, and by golly it did, because of high-speed travel, because of television, because of uh, satellites, etc. 
And, and the expectation was among nice, uh, uh, optimistically thinking people that what would happen was the shrinking world, everybody would understand each other more. But uh, what has really happened, of course, is that, uh, to use a mathematical thought, that uh, the number of uh, ways in which n things are related is n into n minus 1, which is an ex exponential notion. It's, it is something that is going to explode under you as soon as more and more people get in on the act. And that's what's happened to us. And far from being simpler, it has become much more difficult because of the added complexity. Now, if you look at a world containing this complexity, and I shall be using tonight the word variety. So there's the first technical term. And it is a technical term, but it's used much as we use it in ordinary life. Variety in cybernetics is defined as the number of possible states of the system. So what I'm saying is our problems are generated, apart from wickedness and apart from power blocks and apart from all those other things, our problems are very fundamentally generated by explosive variety, by the number of possible states of the system that we are led into thanks to this, uh, this, this technological world we live in. Now, one of the funny things about variety is that you, as soon as you notice it, you have to cut it down. For instance, I have just noted a whole lot of new friends here, about 50 people I've never met before, and I know all I know about them is they're human beings. Now, I know something about the variety of the human being. I, I know that it's, the human being has about 10 to the 10 neurons in his brain, which can generate an awful lot of variety. And I know that the interactions between all the, the 50 of those people in this room is a colossal variety. I mean, anything might happen here, might happen. You might play Beethoven's Seventh Symphony, go and build a bridge, anything you might do. But you are, as a matter of fact, sitting very quiet so far, listening. Now, that is an agreement with me to do something about the variety, because if you don't agree to that, we couldn't have the evening. We'd have some other kind of evening. So it's clear that variety can be manipulated in various ways. Now, the world storms on proliferating variety and getting it manipulated. In this process, it seems to me, the will of the people gets completely lost because they are on the receiving end of having their variety reduced. And that will happen to them under a tyranny, certainly, because don't you speak a word out of place or you'll be shot. But it also happens under our kind of system in a much more subtle way, because we people in this room can't actually influence anything in the way that our variety is handled. That is, the, that is the basic thought I want to put to you. And as we look at the map, we will begin to see that it's pretty alarming. Because the, the human potential is thereby degraded and debased and firmly sat on. Now, where's the optimism by which to match that pessimistic opening? <clears throat> I find... There are all sorts of ways of, of getting into this. Tonight we're, we're here for a memorial evening. And I found myself thinking about Lindsay Sutcliffe and her life and its termination, which is a diminution of variety, if you like. And I thought rather perkily, instead of getting gloomy, of a monologue of Stanley Holloway's, which some of you may remember, which says, it'll all be the same in a hundred years a hundred years from now, for I'll be dead and you'll be dead. It will be the same in a hundred years, a hundred years from now. That's a very odd thought. We will all be dead. So what is, what is the world going to be like and what is carrying it forward? Stanley Holloway puts a nice little humorous quirk there by saying, and someone else will be well in the car a hundred years from now. I like that lightening of the atmosphere. The fact is 
that we are being replaced by generations. And as I thought about this, this proliferation of variety, it came to me that if we could only introduce a fire break into the human condition so that there was nobody around and then start again in a hundred years, so we would have a chance to rethink everything. So clearly we can't do that. But what counts as equivalent, or might count as equivalent, is the fact that about half the people in the world are under 20. And again, I thought of Lindsay Sutcliffe, who was still in her 20s when she died. If half the world is under 20, then surely, 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 it ought to be possible to recreate the world somehow. So what, how do we do it? Do we talk about education? We have met in an educational institution. Of course we talk about education. But the trouble is, my friends, we don't know what to teach. Any more than I know what to say to you tonight. There are no answers to this stuff. And the trouble is, and here is a very nasty thought to, to, to start off with, a very aggressive thought, because we are all in education in one form or another in this room. But the things we teach are the things that have got us in this mess. <laughs> so bring in there. I teach from time to time in the Manchester Business School, and I was asked last year to, to, to teach on a program for Africans on hospital management, and I refused. On the grounds that we have no idea how to manage a hospital, and if any, if any of you have ever been in one, I'm sure you'd agree. <laughs> There's no place for the sick, I can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> now, what I'm trying to do with this weird introduction is to say to you, look, we, <clears throat> excuse me, we have a proliferating variety going on. We have a lot of influences on that variety which we are trying to steer towards what end? Not towards the end of knowing what we already know doesn't work, for God's sake, but towards some better end, something we might call adaptive, something we might call a learning system, in which therefore we cannot afford to put too much didactism, too much a prioristic knowledge, the only fruit of which we know is it doesn't work. You know, there is a very big paradigm shift involved in looking at that problem like that, because we tend, hopefully, to suppose that everything is more or less all right, that the not workingness of things is an aberration, that if we put more money in, or more effort, or more care, or more love into the things we, we have and we are trying to get right, they will somehow come right. Now, all my kind of analysis, in using the, what I would call the cybernetics of social systems, if you want a phrase, suggests that the, the very structures that we are trying to use are out of gear with the rate at which the expanding world is operating. Now, I'll show you what that means with a very swift drawing, and some of you may have a chemical background and will know what the, the Chatelier's principle is. That's just for those who know. Those who don't can just look at my diagram. If you bombard a system Le Chatelier was talking about physical chemistry, but I will generalize it. And this system is operating in this space and is in a, some kind of equilibrium at that point. Then disturbances from outside are going to rattle it. It will, it will uh, move around. Uh, but it will, of course, we expect, unless the whole thing blows up, find a new stable point, and there it will come to rest. And then, of course, the battering starts again, and it will have to move again. Well, in fact, of course, the battering in social systems is continuous, but there are peaks of, of battering. There are 
huge waves of perturbation hitting the social system, and whether you want to talk about education or the family or any other social phenomenon, the economy, you are going to find that the, there are waves that produce this perturbation and then the thing settles down, or we hope it does. Now, my contention is, and the, the, the thing I'm using to, to try and get you to think about this, is that if we put in social structures which were geared as they were, and this is about the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, to that kind of technology, the perturbations came along at a certain frequency which the structures could then adapt to and produce this new point just as a crystal will in Le Chatelier's principle. But if then, by the massive redevelopment of technology and the explosion of the world in the way I began to describe it just now, these perturbations come along at a rate faster than the rate at which this darn thing will settle, then you see why we're in trouble. Now I think that that's, that's what's happening. We've got explosive variety, which we cannot contain. That point then oscillates, and we begin to lose any recollection of what stability may be. And this is why people feel so, thinking people, feel so uneasy about the framework that they are operating in, that the world seems to be uh, running amok. Well, the answer would be that it is running amok, and it's running amok because that point never settles. Now, I just want to show you the power of that notion, if you will. If that point never settles, A, we're in constant crisis management, because we're totally preoccupied with getting that thing to simmer down. I put it to you that the evidence is that that is true. You know, we are in crisis management. I, I do a lot of management consulting, uh, particularly among governments, and it is totally impossible to get anybody to think of more than a week ahead. And, you know, anything over that is, is long-range planning. <laughs> uh, a month ahead is blue sky thinking, you know. They, they, they... It's worse than that. If that doesn't settle, not only are you in constant crisis and in constant neurosis because of the crisis, but you lose the recollection of what stability means. Now, if you have no reference point, no stable point to work from, then you cannot run effective experiments, which is the basis of all learning. You need a learning system needs a point of reference from which to measure departures, and then to come back and ask if those departures are adaptive to its, its purposes or not. So A, you're in crisis, B, you can't learn. If you can't learn, I won't, spin the, I won't drag this out. Just think fast, please. If you can't learn, you can't adapt, and if you can't adapt, you can't evolve, and the whole biological notion is uh, destroyed. And if you want evidence of that, then how are you into your doom reading these days? See, one of the ways in which society has managed to cut down on variety for us is to make it clear that uh, people like me are called prophets of doom and therefore they can be conveniently disregarded. Now, currently, I wanted to draw your attention to two books, and I just uh, um, I said I was going to make this interactive, and I'm talking a hell of a lot more than I intended to already. Uh, who has read Jonathan Shell, The Fate of the Earth? Just two, three? Well, here we are with a scenario which says that if, um, if there is a nuclear war, then in the first strike, the United States will be a democracy of grasses and insects. That's his phrase, and you should read that book. I mean, it is just shattering. What is the will of the people response to that kind of threat? In Maryland, they have spent something like $2 billion on an exercise to work out what they will do if there is a nuclear strike. 
And do you know that cars with odd-numbered number plates go on the second day? And cars with even-numbered number plates go on the first day? And everybody is exhorted to bring a packed lunch. <laughs> I'm glad you laugh because you've got to let it out somehow. That is true. Now, that is how the will of the people gets met, you see, with all sorts of bogus things and the statement that Jonathan Shell's scenario is, of course, uh, irresponsible against the public good, likely to cause panic, and well, I should think so too. That's me speaking in brackets, but that's what people are told, and that is how the variety is reduced. And of course, the slicker we the slicker we get about our methods of communication, the more effective is that job done of just saying, "Well, I no, really, I mean, we we can't handle this. It's not going. That's not feasible." The other book is Jerome de Hus, originally written in in French, but called in English "The Eighth Night of Creation." Anybody read that? Nobody this time. Well, that again is a very, very remarkable book, looking not at the nuclear thing so much as at um, ecology and acid rain and things of this kind. But it does consider nuclear, not warfare, but nuclear um, accident. And it says, that it demonstrates that if one nuclear power plant in northern Germany went up, it would wipe out Germany, France, and Switzerland in one go. You know, this is... Now, are you going to say, well, we can't tolerate that thinking, or are we going to say, well, how on earth could one possibly do anything about it? <coughs> Which is where the will of the people comes in. Now, governments can use guns to reduce variety, and if people point guns at you, it's remarkable, I have observed, and my unfort more unfortunate friends have told me firsthand, that you shut up proliferating variety. It induces a most peculiar kind of uh, blanket on you. But equally, I am suggesting, not perhaps equally, but very nearly equally, if you are sufficiently hectored by a certain kind of politician, <coughs> By a certain kind of slickness, as I feel about, uh, as I uh, would interpret uh, the way the media do the variety reduction trick, it all looks so polished, you see. And it becomes very, very difficult to imagine the variety proliferation and disruption that this very, very unbalanced world we live in would would instantly disintegrate into if if any one of a lot of things happened now i haven't come here to, to, to uh, scare the pants off you but you see unless we are going to look at some of those things fairly fairly well and truly in the eyes we shan't have any motivation to get deeper into the thing that i want us to discuss and in any case it is highly relevant to talk about the way in which variety is reduced, because our options lie in the variety that we are not allowed to entertain. And this we are going to keep on down the same old road. So how can you get that in the face of the hectoring and of the guns and so on? How could you get to this notion of it, of it won't all be the same in a hundred years? We have to get variety back into the system in order to do that. And that's really what I want to talk about. So with that introduction, I will risk shoving this map around. And please, please don't be frightened by it, because we'll, we'll, take, it, we'll take it fairly uh, slowly. And if you begin to look at it while it's being distributed, you will see that on the top here, is, is some kind of systematic way of looking at what I've just been saying. I'd better keep a copy of this, I think. Could we just sort of swizzle that round the room? <laughs> this 
How many copies are there, sir? There's supposed to be 50, because I was told that 50 people were coming, but I think there may be more than 50 people here, aren't there? <laughs> you only put down 50, well, in that case, it's all right. Mm -hmm. Well, let us, uh, if we may, use this as a map and not uh, just sort of freak out in principle about being confronted with such a thing. <clears throat> Do you see how the top piece of this matches what I was saying? The big circle is meant to represent the variety of human potential, where variety is the number of possible states. And what I've suggested is, inside that circle are two heavy squeezes which have reduced the variety of which human beings are capable. And you may well agree that in many cases, and in large measure, it's a jolly good job. You know, we, we, uh, we don't want to use all our variety, otherwise life would be completely incoherent. But the question is, have we, have we diminished variety in the right way. Now, if nothing works, then clearly we haven't. So there's, there's something else going on here, and this is what the diagram is supposed to be uh, d demonstrating. So uh, the first piece of the variety squeeze is this odd thing that it'll all be the same in a hundred years, which still leaves me in a, in a very reflective mood, and I'll leave that one with you, because that has been a variety reducer and could be a variety expander if, indeed, the half the world that is under 20 has idealism and refuses to follow the same path. All the pressures, however, we should note, which is the upper half, which is called historical preemption, this is, the, this is the route mankind has followed, which, which indeed has reduced human potential to a particular spectrum of options, as I've called it. We still see ourselves as having, having options, but I want you to realize that we, we've thrown a whole lot overboard that we could get back. Uh, it is said that uh, hero of Alexandra was... Uh, was told to shut up about his uh, some of his inventions, notably the uh, the jet engine, uh, because uh, the philosophers of the day didn't think, and uh, they were largely the rulers of the day, didn't think that that was going to be a very productive thing to do. And I like that story, whether it's true or not, because maybe we shouldn't just be following our technological nose, but we are. And if anybody here has ever tried to get a grant, you'll know it. You get a grant to do more of the same. You don't get a grant to do anything novel because people will say, well, that's new. Don't be ridiculous. Try and get a PhD thesis accepted. And you will find, will you not? Some of you must have tried it. That if you propose to do something that hasn't been done before, the supervisor is likely to say, I don't know anything about that. This I know about, do a thesis on that. You see what I mean? Well now, I'm saying first of all that we have squeezed our range of options down to a spectrum, we have squeezed our potential down to a spectrum of options which could be reconsidered if we had a mechanism. And then I'm saying that the immediate things that we do, the immediate regulators of our society squeeze the uh, spectrum of options down to what I've called here um, a range of something choice, which I can't read. Yes, right. I couldn't get perceived into the square. <laughs> See how you lose your variety. The range of perceived choice is not as big as the range of options, and that's a comforting thought providing we could find a mechanism to release the, the things that are squeezing us. Now, the things that are squeezing us in the short term, I mean, in the, in the nitty-gritty of life, as distinct from the big historical things that I've been talking about, 
I have listed here as <clears throat> subcultural conformity, which of course is a variety reducer because people by and large say, well, you know, he's got his hair uh, done in a, a thing painted pink, so must I. Uh, and that you notice it isn't usually the conformity of punk rockers that worries people, that, 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 you know, that becomes the issue. It is the conformity of people uh, who are regarded as respectable. And then habit is a, is a variety reducer. And so indeed are low variety models. Now, anything that you have in your head as an explanation of what the hell is going on is a model of the world. And we've got to realize that we may get those models wrong and reduce variety, and overly reduce variety, in so doing. Now, you think about your relationships with other people, if I can try and bring this home in a personal way. We, we say of somebody else, uh, oh, that's not him. That's, uh, that's not typical at all. He, he, he was not acting in character. How do we know, you see? What we mean is that the model we have of him doesn't fit what he's doing. And instead of saying our model is wrong, we say he's not himself today. And just it's just the same as the example I gave you earlier of big social systems where we say, well, that doesn't work. But instead of saying, therefore, it's wrongly structured, we say, well, it's aberrant behavior. Something went wrong. We'll put it right in future, but we never do. I started counting the number of institutions I went to, for example, where all the escalators were working. And I got to about 200 without finding a single institution where all the escalators were working and gave up because it's quite clear that escalators are things that don't always work. No? Whereas the model says that they do, only just today it so happens that. That's the difference. So our models are not necessarily adequate at all, and they are variety reducers. Now, I wrote separately from that collection, underneath the set of media conditioners that I mentioned before that worry me so much as reinforcers of these models. And that's why I say with feedback and put an arrow up there, you see where we are on the diagram to the, the main variety squeezers are reinforced, I'm arguing, by feedback through the media, which uses the models that we already have got, because what else can it use if it's going to communicate? And by using it, and by using it very skillfully, in particular, reinforce it. Now, on the right of that diagram, I have uh, a world system, which is everything that's going on, focusing on something that I have called explicit doom. And I've given those references to the two books down the bottom. Uh, we know that the world is under a large number of pressures of the kind I've just written on the uh, blackboard, and I've listed some of them there. We know that there are political pressures where people are essentially trying to gain power over each other. We know there are economic pressures, which is much the same thing without the guns. They just come along a bit, a bit behind. And we know about mili military pressures, we know about religious pressures. Those seem to me to be some of the major categories that focus the world on an explicit doom, by which I mean what it will actually be like at some future day that I use Doom to draw attention to, although it may be unpopular, to the, the, the terrible risk that we are in <coughs> unstable equilibrium. And that the sort of things we ought to be measuring are variety, how it is contained, how it is conditioned, how it is generally massaged by, by powerful people, and how it is doing all those things directly to a goal of disaster. Well, it's a sobering thought, I think. Now, what I'm, what I'm planning to do is to go on uh, to discuss ways of looking at this situation 
Under the heading of the variable system, you see it there, to which the next diagram, figure 2, refers, and under the notion of the self-reference system, which is to which the next diagram refers. So I thought that we ought to pause at that point, because this thing across the top, which I have now discussed, is a sort of statement in chief of what I think we're up against, and I thought you might like to join in at that point and say something yourselves. I mean, do, do, do you find that a, a true statement of affairs? Do you find the, the way of looking at it through the notion of variety and focused variety helpful or not? Or what else? It strikes me uh, mm. very, very, very helpful, actually, but it strikes me that one of the most particular and most neglected squeeze is what we might call the economic squeeze. That is that very, very few people are really left with any choices about how they spend what is their most human activity, which is doing things. Uh, there are a huge number of, in quotes, lucky people who can put a thing on and off the conveyor belt and get paid at the end of the week. And there are various other unlucky people who are trying to get the privilege of, of, of doing that. Uh, and that this is, you know, some of the uh, the ideas which are regarded as rather uh, mystical and uh, uh, whole bread and sandals approach actually uh, are very important attempt at this, but the, the problem about it is that they are flying to the periphery of the system, as it were, uh, to be allowed to do this. Uh, whereas, as in the system itself, this happens more and more, and the uh, technological revolution, which is constantly in the media, which is being done to what you said it is being done to, is really terribly uh, focused on uh, making this operation, this empty operation, the squeezed operation, worse and worse and, and worse. Mm, it, is. it absolutely is. Now, if I could build on that a little bit, uh, thank you for that contribution. I, in the first place, I think that we ought to face the fact that um, unemployment is, is with us. That, that is something that is going to be a permanent feature of human society because the rate of the population explosion is such that jobs cannot be created fast enough. I mean, it, I think that this is, it's not something one can actually prove, but it's something one can see really rather clearly. We're going to have four billion people by about the turn of the century, and there just won't be that number of jobs. So we better start reclassifying. And if we look at it in our modern England, Britain, uh, I think that, uh, you know, it is high time to stop using the word unemployment and to try and, uh, you know, there are many schemes, as we all know, the notion of paying people a, a, a basic rate to just to be, be around, you know, and then you start rethinking what you're going to do about jobs. All of that, all of those options are open, and I don't want to fall into the trap I mentioned of enumerating the world when I started speaking, because we can't do that. There is a whole raft of possibilities that you have raised there. Let's, let's look at that raft without trying to enumerate them. The other thing I'd like to say is that uh, I am very struck uh, myself by the, the decency of people as distinct from the powers that get hold of people. And I would like to respond to you in this dimension by saying Suppose people knew, and we could easily bring it home to them, and television has done quite a good job on this one, I think. If people knew the conditions under which sugarcane was harvested, and the conditions under, in, in uh, Jamaica, let's say, and the conditions under which tea was harvested in Ceylon, let's say, I doubt that anybody in Britain would mind paying twice as much as they pay now for those commodities, even people on the door. Because we, you know, because it's not that big a component of our, our spending. But of course we all know, not, not being, uh, I 
absolutely naive that there is no way where well, we could get that that second hundred percent of money back to the people we'd like to have it. It would it would dissipate. Obviously, it would. We had, we don't have the mechanism. So those are those are two responses to what you said. Let's have some more. I'd like to raise a couple of questions. One was, you said, and you got a, a, a laugh of agreement from all of us, of course the system doesn't work. And I'd like you to expand, as you've just been doing, a bit more on what precisely you mean by that. Uh, because a general agreement uh, can come from disaffected intellectuals in a polytechnic that, of course, you know, a lot of our systems are in a state of chaos and so on. But the other the other end of the telescope on the, the world system might be the one that would, uh, for me, suggest um, the possible uh, next steps from the analysis. I mean, where the system really doesn't work, where it really hurts, is, is among the wretched of the earth, the 80% the of, the, of the five bits. <laughs> uh, that might be the place where the reduction of uh, their creativity and potential variety is not something that they acquiesce in, as we tend to do in our culture, but something that is imposed on them, and given the opportunity, there can be an explosion of creativity, of which we, we can't really grasp an image yes. here. Well, I, you know, I, uh, yes, I very much agree. We, let me try and link those two ends. See, if, if I come into somebody's house, in our highly civilized society. The handle will have fallen off the refrigerator. The doors don't fit. You know, if you want to say nothing works in this house, by God, you can prove it. Now, people have been led along a path which says, well, actually, this is all very good, and you could put a new handle on, couldn't you? So that they're not really allowed to think that this shoddiness and this, uh, this not workability matters. Now, I think it does matter. How come is it that, that in, with all our wealth and so on, I walk out of here and look at the architecture? Ah! And, uh, mankind has built beautiful buildings always and now suddenly stops because it's wealthy and because we therefore use economic variety reducers which tell us that we must minimize the cost per square foot. If you minimize the cost per square foot, you'll get boxes. You can't get anything else. So this is where the thing links, because we then go to the third world, which is where I spend most of my time, and you think, if only these people were not led into believing that this is what they ought to do. When I first went to Chile and saw the, the squabble over, over linea, linea blanca commodities, white line, uh, refrigerators and all those washing machines, all those things, I was completely astonished and horrified. When I went into the poblaciones and saw people living in tin sheds with sacks over them, with a television set? And what are they watching? They're watching American soap operas which say, this fellow, this is how you should be living. Now, if we could stop, if we, you know, it is a question of values at this point. Now, all the pressure that we put on the world, on the third world, in my opinion, and now I'm getting very uh, away from the sort of cool scientific bit here, and uh, why not? <laughs> the pressure we put on them is to follow us in order to finance our indulgence in these absurdities, it seems to me. Because I mean, we've now got 40 countries, quite suddenly, are, are more or less in bankruptcy. Why? I mean, could you, can you, can anybody in this room convince me that I, it is improper to use the word usury about the way that the third world is financed? We will lend you more money to pay the installments on the last lot of money we paid, we lent you well knowing that you cannot repay the interest. That's usury. And we've got expensive bankers, 10,000 of them in Toronto the other month, you notice. 10,000! The mind boggles. <laughs> and they are saying, you need this money in order that you can have all these goodies. 
stop. What goodies? I don't want them. Oh, but you have to want them, otherwise we cannot continue our system. This is the mess I think we're in. And I, you know, if it's this bad, it's, it, it, it has to be said, and of course it's a political thing. Well, you started this, what are you going to say? The, only, the other <laughs> one I wanted to raise was, you said that under the bombardment you get crisis management. And I'd like to ask you whether it's a product of your job that makes you say that because management is in crisis, nobody has a reference point or a recollection of what stability means. And I would again mm. refer back to the masses, the, yeah. the wretched of the earth, who have in myth, legend, etc., etc., uh, a sense of history, yes. a sense of the archaic, and which again may be the, the, the possibility of hope for, for the release of a range of I drugs. very much agree, and we'll get to that if we ever get to the third oh. diagram, I hope. But in the meantime, let me just say that all the people, of, I'll pick on India this time, all the very beautiful people I know in India who have got their PhDs at Stanford and so forth, are trying to, to, to knock out of, of the social wheel, the very things you're talking about, on the grounds that they, it's time India call up, and that those are superstitious nonsenses. And they're quite appalled when I, when I quote uh, uh, Patanjali to them. <laughs> and they say, why are you talking like this to us? No, we've grown up now, we've got PhDs, and stop it. So, I'm right with you. <laughs> Sorry, you try and get it. Yes. Yeah, I can see. <laughs> I'd be grateful for a little more clarification, really, on your view of, of variety and its relation to developing industrial technology, because I sense a certain tension. On the one hand, you seem to be saying we're escalating the complex industrial society. As it were, the time is itself producing uh, and the changes that, that come about through time in themselves bring about more complexity and less variety. Yet, at other times, in what you say, I seem to get a perception that you grasp exactly the opposite, which I think is perhaps more true, which is that as industrial technology advances, we get less and less variety and more and more uniformity. I mean, we've now got 40 different companies selling hamburgers. Mm, and. The, the range of foods available gets less and less. We've got a proliferation of corporations building homes, but they're all standard Parker Morris crap. Uh, so it seems to me that as what's happened, if you look at Channel 4, I, I don't expect it to be any better, any more varied than Channels 1 to 3. So it seems Welsh. to me that we're getting this uniformity. But then on the other hand, your attitude to variety itself puzzles me because you talk as though variety is a goal in and of itself. Well, sometimes you talk as though variety is a means to an end. I mean, you recognise that there are some possible futures which might be t not entirely non-viable, but would be extremely undesirable. Yes. Fascism, brutalism, oh. barbarism is a, might be a possible viable future, but a wholly undesirable one. So it's not as if, surely, we want variety for its own sake, uh, and it's not as if we want only certain kinds of possible futures. You're talking about the will of the people, so presumably you want that kind of future in which people can genuinely exercise their own wills and have control over their own lives. Choice is the word. Okay, but now it may well be that escalating industrial technologies and going in the direction of reducing choice. Mm. But okay then. Okay, and then just can you clarify the relationship between variety and technical change, and is variety or choice a goal in itself? Well, frankly, I think you're doing marvellously yourself. I mean, this is just what I asked you to do. I'm not trying to duck anything here. I mean, I said, please grapple with this stuff, and this is the very point. The human potential does have this variety Poof, thing to do. So if you're Bach, you can snatch that stuff out of the air and play it for us. Now that's a use of variety, but if you're if you're taught that uh, that you can only uh, have one kind of music for ideological reasons, then you can't be Bach. Now, this whole business I'm suggesting of the design of social systems and the way we can perhaps or not influence them is 
is what I call variety engineering. That's what we're talking about, and I think, and you have just made it abundantly clear that that's what we're talking about. Because everything you do will either, pr will either amplify or uh, attenuate variety. Now, all the designs of systems that I get into, and I hope that this will become clearer by the end of the evening, but I'm very happy that you are pushing it to the fore, because I think we can make it clearer during the course of the evening. All of this is, all, uh, is built on the analysis of how variety absorbs variety. And, and you give me the chance to say that. Because what, what really happens is that if let's let's look for a few examples of this. You, sorry. I go straight to Shannon because well, what why not? Talk, why go to well? You go to Shannon if you want to go to Shannon. <laughs> uh, well, I to mean, communicate you have to explain it. Yeah? To, to communicate an idea, you have to have uh, an adequate uh, variety handling capability. Um, simply that. And therefore, to so understand that, an idea, yeah. okay. that, that fails to communicate. So you don't. Uh, to, to, to communicate an idea, you have to have an adequate variety handling apparatus. What? Sorry, I don't want to say that. Well, this is just a force. If I have to describe a five state machine to you now over a period of a hundred years, I have a channel with less variety handling capability than if I want to describe a five state machine to you over a period of two minutes. You need lots of words to say something complex. <laughs> you see, no, we can, can explain that with the, this, this conversation, everybody else, please know, is exactly exemplifying what I said, right? You need variety to absorb variety. He's come through with a, uh, forgive me, Nick, that you put your head on the chopping block. <laughs> He's come through with a whole basin full of variety, which is shoved and thrown at this guy like a bucket of water, who says, ow, you know, you, I, I'm drenched. Now, this is because there's too much variety and too little absorbing capacity <laughs> of that remark. Now, what, what do you do in a conversation? You do exactly what our friend here just did and say, hold it, brother. I mean, that. I don't know what you're talking about. This forces him to redefine the terms. Now, notice what will happen by the time these two, two chaps have simmered down over a beer and understood each other. They will both have the same variety. That's the lesson. Because he will have explained something of certain complexity, which he will have taken on board with a certain equivalent complexity. Whether they agree or disagree, I don't care. What I am saying is that they will understand each other only when there is, and the word is there. So you want that? Well, now, let me answer that by saying I don't want it, but it is, I believe, the law of nature that systems do not settle down until the variety is equivalent. So it's a bit like water finding its own level. Variety finds its own level. Because you cannot live with it if it doesn't. Now, all this is coming out of the conversation, as I hope it would. Just please try and tie in what's going on now with, with my opening remark. See, the reason we squeeze down variety of the human potential is we can't handle it. It becomes too much for us. So we say, don't tell me any more. You know, there's a poster in everybody's office saying, you have just told me more than I wish to hear. <laughs> this is very, very real. Sorry. Yeah, undoubtedly, yes. Just as the function of psychosis is to, is if that's your model, that's how you behave. <laughs> Side tracking. <laughs> what worries me is that, uh, and it only because I'm sure I, I don't quite understand something, is that um, that you, you described. Uh, the doomsday scenario, I think, very aptly, and I, I agree with you. Uh, and that raises very, very short-term questions about what we, the people, if, if you will, are going to do about it. And it seems to me that even in your diagram, uh, the, the explicit doom that you talked about is linked up with the organizational system right. that you began to talk about, which in, in one sense, indeed, suffocates variety. 
Yet it seems to me that if we're going to, in the short period of time we perhaps have left, to do anything about that organizational system as people, uh, it's going to require an enormous amount of organization on our own part. That's right. And consequently, in part, it's going to require an enormous amount of uh, constriction of our variety, perhaps from a different mm. perspective. And uh, it, it's that tension that really puzzles me. Right. Um, it's very puzzling. Again, we'll get on to this loop. I mean, that's a beautiful introduction to going straight on. But uh, perhaps other people want to say more, or shall we go on? Because I'd really like to get through this, bef you know, I don't want the evening to stop with us having got not reconnected. Sorry, do you want to speak at the back then? Yeah, back to you, Les Le um, the, the idea of this thing. So, can you speak up? Yeah. The impression I got was that you, you'd uh, put over the idea that a lot of the problems started with the uh, rise of technology. Um, and that this, this started the destabling of the system, but uh, hasn't really the system from the year dot been in an unstable situation, and that there is actually no uh, stable reference point which we could look at. No, I think uh, it, it may be true to say it's unstable, but not as damn unstable as all this, is what I'm saying, you see, because as someone pointed out just now, and I think they were right, um, the tradition of the family, for example, has been a very stable reference point throughout a lot of uh, civilization, and not at other times. I mean, you need the social anthropologists in on this one. That keeps recurring as a stable thing, but technology is not bad. In fact, the pill is not bad, and that's technology. The problem is live and well. It's doing really well. I mean, you know, Different sort of family, I submit. No, the traditional family. Is it? Yes. I mean, you know, Dolly Parton sings about DRB or RCA, and everyone knows really that she's singing the praises of the family, and everybody's buying her records and agreeing with her. Well, that's you know. the care. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but the American, I, I've been involved with this uh, recently with the, with, with the United States. Now, the, the United States define the nuclear family as a mother and father and 2.3 children, or whatever, you know, where the, the man is the breadwinner. Now that was the stable family for thousands of years, so we've got to define our family. Well, that's why I said we need the social anthropologist in our, in our, uh, In our kind of civilization, it's about 150, but uh, what are you going to make of uh, the whole of the Jewish tradition for 3,000 years? What are you going to make of Indian tradition for 5,000 years? So, can I just get in here? What, what's so great about stability anyway? I mean, this is... Well, let's finish this. Well, that's, a, that's another issue. I, I want to deal with one thing at a time or we get absolutely lost. Look, the, the stable family as thus defined, and this is what you were challenging, mm -hmm. uh, is now 11% of the United States. Now that's not very high. Yeah, okay. The rest is different. So we are dealing with something which is which is much more fluid than that kind of stability. So now we come to your point, what's the, uh, the thing about stability? The thing about stability is you've got to have just enough to produce the reference points that you need in order not to blow apart. So you're talking about social order. Anyway. I am. But you're not, you're not addressing the question of what kind of social... No, well, that's, that's figure two, because I keep saying, I'm sorry about that, but we are forced to proceed in some kind of order. But when you said, <laughs> when you said earlier that, that you were talking about having not too much variety and not too little, and that was the important question, surely the more important question is, is what kind of social order? Of course. The point is that you don't even get around to being able to ask that question until you've got some kind of quiet. No, you don't. I mean, you're just, you're just fighting or uh, lost, or just struggling, as most of the world is, to feed itself. The trouble with that way of putting it is that saying you, you, you'll get a conception of some goal you wish to reach, but you won't get to it from here. <laughs> because you're saying we, we've got to get from here into some other impossible situation before we can get from there to where you want to go. And 
Well, uh, I want you to think about this, and you are thinking about it. Okay, I have to, I have to be content with that until we've got a bit further. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I'm, I'm a bit, I'm a bit confused now. Forgive me, but we started out suggesting that variety is squeezed, um, and our problem here is that people are not allowed to flower. You know, the thousand flowers aren't allowed to bloom. All those flowers of variety. We now seem to have come full circle and said that our problem is in fact that there's too much variety. I mean, the food thing, forgive me, but the very fact that we can have 20 different kinds of hamburgers compared to 20 years ago, which I remember when you could only get one kind of food if you went out for a meal of an evening, is actually <laughs> most remarkable. Um, variety. They're all the same. They're not all the same. You can, now eat Indian, you can eat Chinese, you can eat Italian, you can eat Spanish, you can eat Mexicano, all of which were not possible 20 years ago. You can now have virtually any kind of food in the world in this town, not outside it. We do have variety, but that seems to detract from stability. If the suggestion is that what we are looking for is a balance between the rebel and the reactionary, the creative and the conservative, and that somewhere in that balance health lies, that's, that's another matter. Well, it is another matter. But that is the matter, isn't it? Surely it's it balance is. balance between the conservative and the radical, essentially. All right. Well, so. Well, it may well be, but the, the, nothing will all, you see, those, those are judgmental words. Nothing will alter the sort of basic physical fact that until you have requisite variety, you don't have, regulat you don't have regulatory powers. That's the real point. Because always and anon, the extra, the higher variety unit will swamp the understanding and the ability to react to the lower variety unit. Not meaning doom. Is not meaning doom judgment. No, not in my book. But what I find I mean it, it is in another discourse. <laughs> yes. What I find very difficult to comprehend is that you disregard or throw aside all forms of labelling which you say is no good. You then propound a, a theory which is has a unity all of its own which, as far as I can see, is yet another form of labeling, mm. and say, but we must look at this, which you then define in verbal terms as varieties. Now, I could take exactly that and redefine it in a totally different form. Yes, you could. And we would be talking about the same things with different words, but coming to possibly similar uh, conclusion in a different structural way. And this is where I find that I'm getting totally confused yes. by this <coughs> arbitrary use of the word variety and the rejection of all other systems of analysis. No, well, let's, uh, let's try and cool that. I, I do accept what you're saying. What I, set up, what I said at the beginning was that let us, let us agree for the purposes of this thing to, to develop another language. Now, of course, it's a language, and of course, it's open to those objections. If, if the mere attempt to communicate always does this, and this, uh, you know, just hold each other's hands and look in each other's each other's eyes and hope that uh, some kind of osmosis goes on, we have to use language. Now, this is a language I use. Now, the, the definition of variety is not arbitrary <coughs> in cybernetics. Well, it is. If, yes, it's not just something I. Thrombogy. It is it's a technical term in cybernetics, and it means the number of possible states of the system. Now, that is a calculus which we have not been invited pre pre previously to invoke or imagine. We usually ca count heads, or we, or we count dustbin lids, or we measure things by money, and that's the outstanding one. I'm asking you to, to try the experiment of thinking about it in terms of variety. Now, it's clear to me that you accepted the invitation because that's why you feel confused, and that's great. I mean, if, if you end the evening feel, feeling totally confused, that would be a pity, but you are showing symptoms of wrestling with this thing, which is just what I beg you to do. Uh, I hate to say <coughs> this, but uh, uh, aren't we confusing a system and a metasystem, and that what you're really falling back on all the time is saying, we want a system which will allow everybody's opinion to be consulted. And certainly a system that takes into account every possible factor that can be in interaction with everything else. So rather than say what sort of, in answer to the lady's question, what sort of system you're talking about, you're not yet on to talking about a system 
you want to talking uh, you are talking about setting up the means whereby we can discover what system we want as okay. here or whereby in some more mechanical way once all the elements are connected up they will automatically and definitively interact in such a way that there are no more sort of informational barbarian hordes who will sort of sweep in and uh, mm. upset the civilization in the box. That's, that's very my nice. reading of what's that's happening. Fair enough. Can I just check that I understand where we're at now, which is, will it be fair to say, this little, little exchange we had before between Nick and Eric, where Nick was overwhelming Eric with variety and he said enough of that, Supposing the, the variety was balanced, and at that point there was, an under, there was an understanding between the two, but the understanding led to the fact that they decided they hated each other, in fact wanted to kill each other. So there's no, I mean, at least the variety was balanced, they knew at least where they stood. <laughs> now we know, now we have to enter on to the, the next phase of the discussion of how to handle that situation so that the thing doesn't blow apart. Sure. Well, that's figure two. Do you want to go on yes. to that? Yeah. <coughs> All right. Yes. Well, if, look, if we look at figure one just for a minute, what I'm saying here on the right-hand side, top right of the diagram, is that this, the, 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 the system that is the, the whole world gives rise to something that I choose to call the viable system uh, as distinct from non-viable systems which you see I've earthed there they, they, they blow up, they don't work now I have spent my life basically on trying to find out the characteristics of the viable system I've set out explicitly to try and do to try and find out what were the characteristics of a viable system about 30 years ago and now I have written uh, the books definitively saying, you see, what, what the viable system is until someone comes on and overthrows that. Now, I would like to tell you in very brief, obviously in very brief, the, the, the main books, the two of them are 500 pages each talking about this, so we, we've got to cool it, haven't we? Um, <coughs> I would like to tell you very, very briefly what I have found to be and what I contend are the necessary and sufficient conditions of a viable system. And the language I'm using is the language of variety, you see, which is why I had to introduce that. Now, if you look at the second diagram, you will find numbers one to five lying about there and that is a contention that there are five necessarily and sufficiently five subsystems in a viable system now i i would like you to know that i started this work through the human nervous system because it seemed to me that that was a very good example of a viable system viable by the way i just used the different dictionary definitions back which is capable of an independent existence so this is really a medical term the fetus is viable if sometime before birth, that is the point where it can st sustain its own life if it is uh, separated from, from the mother. And please notice, we are in a very difficult area here because people often say to me, well, uh, your viable system wouldn't, uh, wouldn't last if there were no oxygen. Oh, well, true, you know. One has to, nothing is ever, contrary to Leibniz's uh, monodology, uh, uh, nothing is ever in biological terms at any rate a, a, a uh, totally isolated system. So when we say it's capable of independent existence we are, we are making uh, some kind of uh, gesture to, uh, to the environment in which it is expected to be viable. I admit that that is a difficult one but you should know it. So I say, I started with the human nervous system and then I developed all this in management and a lot of colleagues have developed it and it's been tried on cells, on bee colonies and all sorts of things. It seems to, it seems to have, uh, so far this, this notion that these five subsystems are necessary and sufficient seems to work. 
So I would like to tell you very briefly what they are so you can see the diagram because this is building up to, I think, a very crucial point about the solution of the mess that I have deliberately tried to create in the room so far. System one is the, the, big, the two big circles are system one, complete with a square box to which the circles are connected through a triangle. And what we have here is that the circle is an operation of the total system, and the square is, its, is the management of that operation. And it is connected, the circle, which is the operation, is connected to an external environment, which is the sort of amoeba-shaped object on the left-hand side. And as you see, there are two system ones depicted that is, two square boxes with accompanying circles and accompanying environments. Now, these are the elements of a viral system. In the body, they are major organs. In industry, they are subsidiary companies or plants, something of that kind. In a bee colony, there are bees. In a, so in a social community, there are people. Uh, inside the body, there may be cells. It, this is a very versatile description, and it is using variety as its measure. Now, the environment throws up a whole lot of variety, which the operation has to handle. And that is done not on a line, as shown in the diagram, but on a loop, which I will just draw here, which says, here is the operation, and here is the environment, and there is a loop that connects them. Now, <clears throat> this is at once something that we can begin to talk about with a lot of ferocious scientific accuracy, if we are prepared, madam, to use the notion of variety. See, it is typical of an operation that its variety is lower than the environment in which it operates. Now, if the law of requisite variety says this thing will only stabilize itself if the variety is the same, and it does, and it would take a long time to prove this to you, but I'm asking you to come with me now on this, this tour, then it is obvious, isn't it, that the variety of this has to be amplified, and that's the ordinary electrical engineer's symbol for an amplifier, in order to make its variety larger to cope with the, with the world. And this variety, or this variety, and that's the ordinary symbol for an attenuator, must be reduced, or both, some mix. Now, let's, let's just try and take that on board. I mean, if you look at this, this room right now, you find me with the low variety and you with the high variety because we are all human beings, you probably, you're 50 times my variety. You could easily swamp me. If you all just started talking, I could not proceed. I mean, if you, if you uh, assaulted me, even more I couldn't proceed. But uh, you, you only have to talk to stop me. So what is going on here? I am amplifying my variety by exerting some kind of presence in the room, by shouting, I'm not talking in a normal conversational vote. I'm commanding attention. These are all amplifiers. You, by convention, are an attenuating your variety by sitting quietly and listening. You are not playing poker over there and writing poetry over here and having a little things on over here. You see how the thing it comes down to a stability. Now, this thing is a homeostat. It is the thing in nature which balances variety. It is the thing that makes you have a temperature which is within your physiological limits to, to sustain, even though the room is getting hotter or colder or whatever. These, the, this is the basic device which operates the law of requisite variety in the world, as I see it. So we ought to have that kind of loop uh, connecting the circle to the environment and connecting the square to the circle because the management of the operation always has less variety than the operation. 
So we've got three things in a row. And in fact, they're not in a row. I've pulled them apart to make them obvious. We have some kind of environment with a squiggly edge, and in that is embedded an operation, and in that is embedded the management. Now, the management of the operation is trying to make the operation work inside of an environment in which the varieties are getting larger as you go out. Now, that's what is on that chart there, except that it's pulled apart. And I put it to you that if you, you try that out on any, anything you like, you will find that's working, and you will find that those attenuators and amplifiers are in place. They are the things that do the squeezing we were talking about in the scenario we first examined. So if the government doesn't like what you get up to as citizens, it passes laws. And those laws are attenuators of your variety. So you cannot go around smoking cannabis. <coughs> or whatever it is. They try to, to, uh, to reduce your variety to something that is handleable by the social system at large. Now sometimes it's done by laws, sometimes it's done by conventions, and it's done in all sorts of ways. And the will of the people is what? Is the will of the people, and you see this is where Eric got in first, but now we're getting round to it. Is the will of the people to have its variety attenuated in order to have a fairly calm situation, or not? And if the government begins to say, look here, you, you reduce your variety down here somewhere, then the people will start saying, this is too much, we're going to have a revolution. Now this is how the varieties boil and bubble in society. And you can see it without all that political overtone, in, if you look at a, a straightforward marketing situation. You, You've got, a te you've got uh, amplifiers, which is called advertising, and you know to, a, to the nearest thousand pounds how much you can increase your market share. It's that clear, you know, which I find a rather dismal thing, but it's, it's the case. That by amplifying the variety, which in this case is the, the adequacy of your product to operate in that environment, you now persuade people that this is true even when it isn't. So you say, here, are, here is a cereal for breakfast and this will do you good. I know a nutritionist who said you would be better off eating the packet. <laughs> Try it out anyway. You, 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 no, not eating the packet. <laughs> be reasonable. Uh, Try this idea out, and you, especially you, please, lady, because you will now begin to see what the value of this kind of measure is. It's only a measure, like another number of others. You were quite right, but I am suggesting to you that you will find this useful. And you put that in any situation, and you will find those amplifiers and attenuators working. Now, what's the value of that? The value of that is that it immediately increases your options to the point of saying, well, perhaps we should use another amplifier or attenuator, which may be less expensive if you're an entrepreneur, which may be more freedom invoking if you're a politician, which may be more pleasurable if you're a hedonist, etc. You know, any of these things. So that's system one. That's what we find is going on at the elemental level of the viable system. And the staggering thing is that all those elements, hold it, are themselves viable systems, according to my theory of the viable system. And that is why you will find inside uh, that drawing a replication of itself. Do you see it there? In the thin lines. Now, in the full logic of this... Uh, demonstration of what is the nature of viability, I have shown that these two things are exactly equivalent. Now, if you see on the map, the th there are three things I wanted to tell you about my treatment of the viable system. One is that there are five subsystems, and we're working on that. And the second is the notion of recursion. And the notion of recursion says that all viable systems contain viable systems, which are structured 
structured by an identical cybernetic logic. And cybernetic here you could read regulatory logic. Now, can I tell you in brackets, because I don't want this to get too theoretical. I went to work in Chile for President Allende and put all this into action for the whole of the Chilean social economy. Now, I'd previously done it all over the place in individual firms and in quite large organizations and institutions of various kinds, but, you know, this is a whole country and this was quite something. Now, a lot of people have said, and you will not be among them, <coughs> <laughs> that it was impossible in two years to link the whole of Chile together with computers and microwave links and to run an economy in real time. But they did it. And the secret was that there were 12 recursions which were all the same things embedded in each other. Which means that if you write a very, very intelligent thinking type computer program, you don't have to do it in this room and it takes you two years and then you go through the door and you say, well now, fellas, it's your turn. <sighs> what are you doing in here? And we'll take another two years, which is how computer applications have by and large been developed in the world. And that's why we're still stuck with payrolls and nonsenses of that kind by way of using the most brilliant piece of equipment that the world has ever devised, the human brain has ever devised. Now, by having 12 recursions in Chile, which is to say the national wheel within which is the social economy, within which are four ramas, branches, light, heavy materials and consumer divisions of the economy. Within each of those, there are various industries, uh, textiles, iron and steel, coal, electricity, fishing, all those things. Within those there are individual companies, then there are individual plants, and inside the plants what do you find? You find departments, and in the departments you find actual people, would you believe, who are doing things. Now this is a set of recursions of the viable system. Now we're beginning to see how we might approach the issue of the will of the people. But before we can quite get there, I have to tell you about the other systems much more briefly. If you have a set of system ones, which are the elements of the system, the plants or the individuals or whatever level of recursion you're going to play with, and I'd like you to, f I'd like to encourage you to feel free about whatever level you'd like to choose to think about. I think about several of them. The total system is going to be made up of these elements. If each of the elements is striving to do its own thing, and this is what we call freedom, and this is what we call autonomy, then how do we know that they are not going to be mutually inhibitory? Now this is where the variety thing really comes home to roost, because I am going to need all my variety to manage my element because my operation is overwhelming me with variety and my environment is even more overwhelming with variety. So I've got all my work cut out as an ingenious manager to handle all of that. But meantime, you... Yes, why not? You... <laughs> are doing your element. And what is to say that we will not choose policies which optimize our performance but are mutually inimical. Now that is what happens in society. And if you live in a house and are trying to learn to play the flute and someone is, has got about 87 decibels of rock and roll and next door, you will not be able to play the flute, although both of you are legitimately pursuing your own objective. Now it is typical of a, situa of a system in that state, this is cybernetic theory that I'm speaking for a minute, that it will go into an uncontrolled oscillation as each element tries to accommodate the other. It overshoots. Do you see what I mean? It begins to oscillate, rattle. That is the reason for system two. And you see there that set of triangles, which is damping oscillation. That's its function. So now we have an organism which 
has elements which can operate in the outside world and are now cohering in the sense that they are not oscillating. But is that enough? Wouldn't it perhaps be better if by some overview of all the elements of the system we could see how the total system would behave more to our advantage? Now that's begging the question of what is the advantage, it's begging the question of what is the purpose of the system? And this is where all the political and religious and economic and ideological things go bazang. This is where the pyrotechnics come from, I think. Just how much autonomy is System 3 going to allow System 1? Now this is, this is the guts of our problem with the will of the people, I think. Let me put it to you in the form which I so often see it in consultancy. I go into a firm at the top. It's easier to take a firm because its purposes are pretty evident. They are, of course, to have a load of fun under the constraint of making a profit, which is something the CBI doesn't seem to understand right now. Um, the people at the top of this firm, I go and see them and they say, well, we have taken on board all the teachings of behavioural science. We know we shouldn't go around bullying people. We are in practice of uh, giving authority, decentralising, uh, practising autonomy on behalf of our component parts. Indeed, we don't really know what we are doing any longer because <laughs> uh, nobody ever asks our advice and we've stopped giving orders. Now this is, you know, I, of course I'm ca cartooning a bit here, uh, ca uh, uh, I'm uh, exaggerating, but not much. You then go to one of the departments, or one of the sub subsidiary companies in the same firm, and everybody's looking at the papers trying to find a job. And you say, what's going on here? And they say, well, between ourselves, I'm this bloody company. You can't do a thing. They go, we want records of everything, we spend our lives filling in forms, and so on. Now, how come? It's the same place we're talking about. And there is the downward perception and the upward perception are quite, quite different. Why? Because the treatment of the variety is misperceived. And what looks to the bosses as a calming of variety, which is going to make life easier for the elements of the system, is perceived by the elements of the system as a gross interference with individual liberty. Now, I put that to you as a company, but isn't that also true in society? Isn't it even true in the family we just agreed didn't exist? <laughs> so the will of the people is somehow bound up with, with that equation. Now, I personally think that that has to do with the purposes of the system. Let's just look at it this way. If we made a, an agreement in here to uh, assassinate somebody, and you are going to, you can you make a bomb, you, you make the bomb, and you will be in charge of, uh, of the transport, and so on and so on. Now, we have now created a viable system to do a particular job wherein it is clear that in agreeing to be a system we uh, abandon our rights to autonomy because if you're not on the right corner at exactly the right minute he's going to get caught with his trousers down and you, you shan't succeed so, so in that sort of determined case you can show that the variety will be totally let's say totally, almost totally I mean, you won't perhaps prescribe what pair of shoes you're going to wear, but mostly you've, you've had your variety delimited for you. If, however, instead of doing anything so stupid as that, we decided on an equally stupid notion that we would found a society tonight for loving people, then we could afford to have the only rule would be that you would be thrown out as an element of this system if called hating somebody. Because there are many ways of showing love, and you could go around doing that, and that would be within the purpose of the system. 
So it seems to me clear from such examples that the equation between system 3 and system 1, where indeed we have a requisite variety, only a stab on I hand, the amplifiers and the attenuators in that loop will be determined by the purpose of the system. So if you really want a democracy, you will have to decentralize and you will have to, to uh, devolve autonomy. And we don't do it. We just talk about democracy. Could you illustrate this from what you said about the firm, the, the sort of firm where you said at the top they think they have devolved it, but it doesn't seem like yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, are you saying that, that they haven't really devolved it, or they have? Uh, who's wrong in this misperception? Well, they're 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 right. Yes, and fair point. I, th I think they're both wrong, you see, usually. But you can see how the misperception comes about, and it really is very extraordinary that so you know so much of the culture, uh, so much of energy in the system is used up fighting this absurd battle. Um, what exactly did you say well, was on uh, the? T the people at lower down who the bosses think have been given freedom experience just having to fill up lots of yes, forms. So yes. presumably this is uh, some sort of feedback requirement, which in uh, an organisation with objectives that you would want to further, uh, it wouldn't right. be asked of people. Well, the thing begins with a perversion of language. You see, if you must not tell your departmental managers or your subsidiary companies things which they are supposed to be free to decide for themselves, what you do is you have a policy. So you have a motor car policy. And that says this man is this height, this age, these qualifications, wears spectacles, he can have a Cortina. So his freedom to choose a car is gone. But that's just a policy, you see? Guidelines. You suddenly find it's a set of rules and regulations. That's that's the sort of thing that in, in practice happened. I think you just set up some factors and allow people to draw the conclusion and there's a, never more than one conclusion. That's the sort of thing I mean. You know, Ford's yeah. famous dictum, any colour you like as long as it's black. And it isn't as obvious as that, obviously. Now, if you look at my diagram, there are in fact six vertical lines which will absorb variety. The first of them is, is the connectivity of the environments running vertically up the page. The second is the thing marked three star, which I haven't talked about. The third is system two, which I mentioned is anti oscillatory and so on. Now, once you show an organization that it doesn't have to use that central axis of command, then you can overcome this problem. That's the practicality of it. Now, where do you get to with government? See, it's extremely difficult to know with government you know, what your legislator is doing. You've got huge lags on all this stuff, too. Well, I shall continue because, we, because we, we'll be here all night. Three to one in this diagram says, well, that is how we run things right here and now and immediately handle our situations inside the organism. And this being so, we absolutely need a system four, which is concerned not with the inside and now, but with the outside and then, as I put it. It is concerned with long-range things and with looking outside the organism rather than with simply reacting. And you see those two damn great heavy arrows there. They depict the, the, the homeostat of three, four. They show how those two things of the investment of effort and care and attention and time, as well as money, has to be balanced between three and four if the variety situation is going to work and the, the organism is not going to tear around in circles under the influence of three or go into a stupor of long-range stargazing under the influence of four. So I think you can see how the variety match has to be operable there. And you could account for the collapse of everything from Rolls-Royce to the, to, to, to the nation by considering how variety is absorbed there and whether the amplifiers and attenuators work. Now, 
I hope some of that has stuck. I hope only that you see the sort of thing this is, because I'm now coming to the central point of the evening as far as I'm concerned, which is what is System 5? Now, according to the logic I've been presenting to you, if you have an organism which is in high trouble in getting the three, four homeostat to work, which is to say getting a balance between the inside uproar and the outside uproar, then you are going to need a system to monitor it, which is system five. In the neurophysiological model, this is, a, this is the cortex, or it's the top management, or whatever it is, you see. Mm -hmm. I'm deliberately fudging this, because I'm trying to tell you what happened to me when I explained all this to Salvador Allende. I had a piece of paper just like this on the table between us, and spent hours going through all this because it absolutely vitally understood it. And I drew in system five with a view to saying, so, where does the buck stop, Compinero Presidente? It's you, you see, I was going to say in my ignorance. But before I could say it, fortunately I spent some time putting in the big five, you know, histrionics. He leant back and he said, ah, El Pueblo. <laughs> now this is one of the most exciting things that ever happened to me and obviously it communicates to a lot of you here the people the will of the people of course see. now somehow that has to be the will of the people and in a democracy we do it by electing a crowd of johnnies from whom you know, none of whom we particularly fancy, but we say, well, you have to embody our will. In tyrannies, somebody comes along and says, well, I'll, I'll embody your will for you. <laughs> but you can see it's the same thing with a different sign on it. Because what we are doing here in terms of pure logic, my friends, and I do want to, you to see this because it's astonishingly important. We are administering closure to the system. We have spread about a system here, and now we are logically closing it. And we are saying, that's it. There couldn't be a system six, because that's where it all comes to a, a stop. If you want to go to something bigger than that, you are, going, you are going to go to the next recursion in which this is embedded. huh? But for the time being, that is the closure. Now, quickly, look at that in terms of your own body. We are no longer just looking at the cortex. We are suddenly discovering something that has bothered philosophers for, for two or three thousand years, which is the question of the nature of selfhood, the notion of identity, the, the idea of self-consciousness. It is closure. Now, that's just to label it, so that won't satisfy a philosopher, but nonetheless, it's a way into starting to think about it in rather different terms. And I would be very happy to give a mathematical philosopher here a notion of how we may be able to push on that inquiry, but not for, for tonight and the whole audience. This, I think, is, is the secret. Now, if the closure involves determining the way in which variety is going to be manipulated, then this is the problem of how to change anything at all. Because the, all the varieties in this system have got to be determined in the act of closure. Because it says this is the kind of system we actually are, and none other. And therefore anybody who says anything differently is um, a parasite or is a virus in the system, is attacking it, stop it. Now, what does? Well, does anybody in the system who doesn't recognize it, that <coughs> death clothing definition is a parasite or a virus? Oh, well, yes. Death. But this is, excuse me, I'm not offering this as a suggestion. I'm saying that's what happens, and this is why we're in the mess we're in. It is totalitarian. So although people are saying to us in Britain, well, you can vote for somebody else at the next election, it's not going to touch it. 
And if I come along and say, well, what we really got to do is change the structure of government in order to make the variety engineering different, ah, now you can't do that. quite nicely up to a five, and then you say what we want in there is the will of the people, and it seems to me you then it's a sort of infinite recursion, you need another system to explain how the people's will is formulated and fed in at level five, rather than up through the system. Well, not necessarily. Uh, Why shouldn't it come up through the system, and what do you think that dotted line is for? Sorry, you uh, you, you, you led with your chin. There's the way in which the, uh, uh, the contributions can forward to an <laughs> You see, the thing is, that, may I just reiterate this? I'm not trying to give you a the- I'm not trying to give you a prescription, and I'm not trying to voice views on you. I'm trying to tell you how I think viable systems work and what light this throws on the problems we've got. Huh? Now, let me go back to. Compañero Allende. He found his second chamber corrupt, which is not as bad as finding it idiotic like ours. At any rate, he. Uh, it's not Lord Eric, is it? <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's just Al is idiotic and corrupt. <laughs> And uh, again, he said to me, look, uh, I would like to replace the second chamber with a, I can't think of the word now, an assembly, sorry, an assembly of the people. And he said, you know, the day has passed when, when you just, you know, everybody turns up and shouts Viva outside the palace. We've got technology. What do you think about that? Well, now, it so happens that I had been engaged in, in the United States and in Germany with, with the notion of, of how you can use technology in order to let people know what, you, what everyone is thinking. Now, you can do this with a telephone with a little bit of an attachment on it, and it's beginning to happen. So on the public television, somebody says, uh, do you prefer product X or product Y? And you, you, your sample, at any rate, as it now is, goes to the telephone and presses yes or no. And the computer operates. And within seconds, the, the whole viewing public says, well, what you, the current audience, think is this? Well, now I've, I've got myself into a very concerned state about that. This was at a time when I was development director of International Publishing, which is the biggest publishing company in the world, and has the Mirror, and then had the Sun, and the People, and all that stuff, and had all the women's magazines, all the technical magazines, books, you name it. Unbelievably large affair, much larger than the general public realized. And I was responsible for all this research and development computers and everything else. Now, you see, let me put it to you this way. If you can gain access to people's in, 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 sorry, instant reactions to absolutely anything, then you can build profiles of congregations of people which, which, in which those people would be so vulnerable. It's not true. Can you not see that? Because you would understand everything about how they react. Moreover, I was in the, I had, uh, I think I'm right in saying, four million names and addresses in, in computers as a result of all these large shows. So, you see, I, I know what magazines you've ordered. I know which offers you've accepted. I don't know why you want a book on the Holy, Man, the Holy Land and also a hardcore porn magazine. <laughs> But I've got ideas about that. <laughs> See, I know you've got three children, otherwise you can't get into a dress this high, even if you are hard for me. <laughs> and so on. So you've got all this power. See? Now, I began to get extremely frightened by this, and I went and gave evidence about all this to the Congress of the United States, I may say, who were, who were extremely alarmed by, by this. You know, this is very practical and immediate, and it can all be done stuff. But, of course, when Allende asked me this question, I thought, oh, <laughs> you see, if you can do it in a nasty way, and here am I going around the world trying to alert people to this danger, 
then perhaps we can do it in a nice way. Now, part of the problem about the nasty way is that when it comes to the will of the people, it's the following. What are you going to ask them? You say, well, we've got some problems. Here is a nice television program on a problem. Do you prefer that we do this, 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 or this? Press the knob. Who, whoever said these were the alternatives? Go back to square one on my map. If they were reasonable answers, we'd have solved the problem already. The reason we haven't solved the problem is that this way of carving it up is not producing results. So we have produced an exhaustive categorization, thereby reducing variety, which we are compelled to do. But it doesn't work, as I have tried to demonstrate all the evening. Moreover, if you ask an untutored person even if, it, even if the classification system was right. Which do you prefer? What the, what the ordinary person says is immediately, well, I, you know, I'm a bit of this and a bit of that. I, I, I'm not going plunging into that one. That's for sure. Hence the don't knows, you know, who, of course, are immediately labeled as either blind, deaf, dumb, or stupid and who ought actually be, to be given medals for being honest. However, none of this approach is going to operate. What is a solution to that? I'll try this on you. I haven't offered any solutions tonight. I wanted to make you think about this thing. What I said to Ian was the following. This is a computer. 10,000 million elements three pounds perhaps, running on glucose at 25 watts. <laughs> nice little computer. Let's use it. Now, if you ask an untutored person, by which I mean someone of, of good intelligence, and there are some, you know, who can't read or write as you go around the world. It's no criticism of their intelligence. And what's more, their intelligence hasn't necessarily been got at by the mechanisms we were talking about before. And you say to them, what do you think of what we're doing? Now, no categorization, nothing but just that, you see. You'll soon get a reaction. You say, keep at it, mate, you know, you're doing, <laughs> that's okay, it's a hard world. Or if you don't shut up, you know, we'll come and throw a brick through your window. This is the kind of thing. Now, that is the meaning of this term algidonic, which you will find on the map which talks about pleasure and pain and not rational reductionist categorization. Now, it is a way in. It's a possibility. And I would like you to think about that. Um, it sounds very simple. You have a meter with, with an orange and blue card on it that fold into each other, right? So you can set this meter to show all orange or to show all blue. And orange is I'm happy and blue is I'm not. And you can set it. And your brain does the computation. And the fact that nobody has access to your brain serves them right. And that's how we see that. Now, it would be possible to have a national assembly, wouldn't it, where every community was, every person in the limit, but every community was voting this way. And one of the very interesting things about this thought is that it carries huge quantities of information both ways without any wires. Uh, try, and, try and imagine this. And I nearly got to this point. Uh, if you see the photographs of the operations room in Santiago, you'll see a blank wall, and that was intended to c carry an old Jodonic meter. You're the Minister of Economics, and you're being filmed from the operations room that's running the country. And we'd done this, don't forget. This isn't all stupid science fiction. We had the operations room. We were running a real-time economy. I told Harold Wilson that no in Britain, as he knows, being an economic statistician, economic data are nine months out of date. 
I told him that in Chile there were no more than 12 hours out of date. Do you know what he said? Any offers? Cut yeah, He said, jolly good. <laughs> Unbelievably English reply. So, <laughs> I mean, that's all he said. <laughs> He didn't say, have you told Tony Ben or anything? So. I'll wait <laughs> so the idea was, uh, what I'm asking you to imagine is this. Supposing you're the Minister of Economics. You're trying to explain to the populace the will of the people, you know. You're saying, I'm trying, good friends, to interpret what you want, and this is what I'm doing. So you begin to explain your taxations plans and every, all the things you're doing. Now, they've all got algidonic meters, which are summed to an algidonic meter which is beside you. See, so there you are, you're doing your enthusiastic political bit, and this thing is going... <laughs> now, what I meant about complex and amazing communication flows is the following. Of course, you need the wires to, to make the meter work, but that's, that's quite easy. You can do that with a telephone system. The complicated thing that I want you to try and hang on to, what would you feel if you were the Minister of Economics knowing that this was going down while you were talking? What would you feel realizing that not only do you know this, but that they know that you know this? And what about they're knowing that you know that they know that you know that this is. Now, this is an amazing piece of logic. It's, of course, it's infinitely recessive, and it's very hard to hang on to it. You try sometimes. <laughs> but it's, you know, it is very, very rich, because your problem of adjusting to, to what that meter is doing is hugely complicated and a very high-variety exercise. So where I got to in Chile with that was I was equipping a factory with it. And every, every little section of men were, were to have a meter which would show up in the managing director's office. Do you realize that is the first time in the history of the world that the boss actually knows what the men think? And moreover, <laughs> you see, the men know that the boss knows that they know. That they know. So the experiments with that, I got all the best psychologists and anthropologists and God knows what in Chile onto this one. Because you just look at the, the potency of that idea. But isn't it immensely manipulable? Yes. I mean, because if you've got a brilliant orator, he would actually know when he was getting through. That's right. And he might be able to adjust things his way. On the other hand, of course, he mm. could be swamped by the negative symbols and change his policy. As it That's right. Well, well you're getting through it. You're doing what I asked you to do, you know. Grappling with this. I mean, this is a high variety system of a non racionative ratiocinative kind. It is an algidonic system. Now I would prefer a philosopher king as the Well, of course he would, yeah. <laughs> yes. And maybe we'll need them yet. Well, actually, back to that, <laughs> because I'm still thinking also get back to the question I asked earlier. I'm, and if you can conclude with this, then fine. But I'm still unclear about, in light of the urgency that, that we all face, and the planet face, as it were, uh, how this system, which, uh, which I can certainly see the logic of, but I, I, I think uh, is, is going to be, to, to put it, to, to put it uh, crudely, very, very uh, long-term in, 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 in terms of its, uh, in terms of the capacity of actually putting it into practice. Well, how is it going to help us save the planet? <laughs> how about saying? How is it going to help us save the planet? Because I still feel mm. that, that, that what is required is an enormous degree of organization and an enormous degree a simple well, uh, as you said, we'll get further into this question. Uh, would someone tell me the time? I've realized that... Um, my God, does anybody object to this? You're all I still here. Right? <laughs> <laughs> well, now, look, all right. Isn't all this looking at the, the uh, problem from the outside? <laughs> Unless you get the individual to be of uh, 
to have the ripeness, the maturity uh, to uh, you give been, them feedback. You've been cheating looking at diagram three, yeah. haven't you? Oh, I haven't. <laughs> well, that's <laughs> where it is. That's <laughs> an education. <laughs> no, seriously, that's where it is. I'm coming to that. If, 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 you know, I'm going to have to hurry up. Look, part of the answer to the speed thing. Now, the, what I'm talking about, and the way I've tried to do it in this kind of format, is an is a anti paradigm thing. It is anti paradigmatic. It is saying that we've got to look at things in a different way. Otherwise, we'll just be part in America, wrote to the new scientists, and actually said that this must be a lie. <laughs> And he also said, thank God it's a lie, because we don't want to live in that kind of society. Now, this is, you know, A, he was wrong. And that was because his idea of putting the economy on a computer would be to create a, a, a nationwide database involving an 1108 or some giant machine in every village, which is absurd. And that's the kind of society I don't want. <laughs> And secondly, he's assuming that I am making some kind of prescription. Now, although I like what you have been saying and you've been very helpful, there's just one little thing I'd like to, to, to rattle around with you. I am not saying let's do this. I'm saying this is what happens. This is my analysis of a viable system. And the reason we can't induce quick change in it is because the variety is all sewn up by a whole bunch of filters of this kind that we cannot break through. And the, the things we hope will help us to break through, like good investigative journalism, good education, and all those nice things are actually making it worse because they are ingraining the models. And they are underwriting the solutions that don't work. And saying, well, maybe if we spend a lot of money on it, we'll get solar energy. That's part of the classification system. Solar energy, yes, great. Let's have a go at that. But what I'm calling for is something quite different. And I am saying that I have proved that you can do it if you change the paradigm. Now, look, Allende only lasted two years, God bless him. And I was there for, this, for the second and third. We had 75% we had of the social economy on this system when the balloon went up. We had nearly got the algebonic meters to work. We had nearly got a model of the, the total economy. And what was that telling us? That was telling us that the United States was going to dish us. And there was no answer to that. So the third thing that Elenda used to say to me that I wanted to tell you was, how do you have a socialist, a socialist country in a capitalist media? Now that is a fundamental systems point, see, because you've got to have an adiabatic shell around you. So not for nothing did the Germans build, did the Russians build the Berlin Wall. It's exactly the right thing to do. They're very good cyberneticians, the Russians. So, anyway, what I'm saying is, please, not no prescription here. This is my attempt to show you how a viable system works and why we are not able, we are not managing to handle it. As to the will of the people, I have written in here Aristotle's word of eudaimony, which is to a measure of well-being. And I would just like to say this about it that electronically one can now do this. Well-being we have been forced to measure in terms of money and goods because that belonged to our culture, it's belonged to our political ideology and, and most of all because it's the only thing we know how to measure. Now if you can once get a, a, a loop of an algidonic kind, you can put a grading even if it's crude, like a number between naught and nine, or even better, my analog system with the green, with the orange and blue, will produce feedback in the system which shows whether there is eudaimony in society, which is another kind of stability. Hmm? But don't we have these measures now? I mean, to some extent, but the I mean, we have opinion polls which are. Which are they're close to it. But again, they're making the classification. But we also have uh, this other question, aside from actually saying, are we happy with the government? Right? There are these other um, comparative studies <coughs> asking people in different countries, are you just, just the question is, are you happy? Or do you think things are all right? And remarkably, 
the, time and time again, the British seem to be happy in spite of, in spite of everything going on. What, 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 what other measure would this be than that? Well, it would be, uh, it wouldn't, you see, it wouldn't be open to the objections of uh, predetermined categorization and all those things I was just criticizing. And it would be built in as a learning system. You see, it's, the, the thing you're talking about is sporadic and, uh, and very hard to handle, and is just used, of course, by politicians to manipulate things. This would be a genuine attempt to create a learning system in society. Mm. But to interpret the results, wouldn't that create the same problems? No, there's people very, come along and say we have a problem with a, interpreting this. That's, that's a very that's nice point. Avoid. See, what you want to try and do is to make the thing self-operating. There is a whole branch of science dealing with self-organizing systems, which would show how this works. Let me, let me try and give you a very quick example. If everybody in this room um, entered into a computer matrix, all the names along the top and all the names down the side. Now, every element of the matrix so formed would represent a connection between two people in the room, and all such connections would be represented. Now, what happens now is that we put 0.5 in every one of those cells and then we set the computer working. And what happens is that you, sir, at the back, address the computer and you say, I have just read Jonathan Schell's book. It's fantastic. You must read it. Now, 0.5 is the probability that you will get that message. So half the people in the room will get that message from him. Now, they read Jonathan Shell's book and they address the computer and they say, don't give me any more messages like that. On a scale 0 to 9, 7, 2, whatever. Never the ultimate limit or you'll cut him out of the system, your system. So you, you, you change the probabilities. Next time you come in, you, you, dist you, you said, I've read that damn book, I don't want that kind of message. The books I've read, after all. But the next thing he comes through is with a recipe for quiche Lorraine, see? Now, you don't like cheese, so he's going down rapidly. But on the other hand, he may suddenly come through with something. Now, this is a very free system that I'm talking about, and something in which we are not saying this is a system for retrieving anything, this is not a system for paying anything, it's a system for using technology for people to interact. And sooner or later, if you find that all your messages are coming true, you two people will decide to meet. And off you go. Now, I'm only using that as an example of how a system can be self-organizing, because the probability will change depending on how you behave. And nobody is getting into the system and saying, it's Keisha Ray in this week, fellas. It's, it, it's just what happens. Now, you think there are a hundred people perhaps in the room, that's, you know, n into n minus one. That's, uh, that's 10,000 interactions going on, on any conceivable subject. Look at the variety, my friends. And nobody can stop this learning, even so simple a device as I've just put forward. Now, this is the sort of thing that I perceive that we can do. Now, I, of course, I could go on for hours about more intricate things, but what I'm trying to do is break through the paradigm to another paradigm here. It's all I can try and do. In the system, you have an underlying assumption that we understand what Kish Lorraine is, or in the case mentioned earlier, of your Minister of Economics in Chile. He would uh, uh, state what he was about to do, and he would get the feedback immediately as to what people thought about his actions. But if you were to say, I'm going to take out a million pounds out of this um, system or this activity to invest it into another activity, right? Do we understand what he means, what he's doing? Well, probably no. not. The way you so would how do we well, the way you handle that? that is, you know, I have to cut the corners here. I, I, I was cutting corners. You have, the, you have a whole studio full of people, just as you do in this country, with some Chilean Robin Day throwing microphones around them. Uh, and you get a, a discussion generated. Now, a good chairman will say, look, not everybody knows what M3 is. You know, would you mind explaining? Part of what worries me a bit is you had this exciting and significant experience with a 
small and doomed nation. And that model may actually reduce the paradigms for us. Uh, because, uh, well, for example, uh, you're, you're exa uh, you say if you don't have, if you have a totally hostile environment, that, that fetus, that newborn baby can survive without its mother, but not if they take all the oxygen away from it and uh, feed cyanide at it. Where, whereabouts can one find the, uh, the size, the scale, in which yes. you can have a workable model? Is it perhaps in, in a village that is so isolated in the third world that uh, the CIA won't know about it until it's actually been shown that villagers of different castes can cooperate creatively and form that, that massive number of interactions that you say is possible in a small community? Or are you saying some sort of utopian vision, which isn't going to save the planet, that says we must change the whole system throughout that's everywhere, all at once, and, and that's the point where the philosopher king idea yeah. comes in, and you and I am, they have to say, the way System 5 has got to be run is by the Pueblo, and but I decide what's the nasty way and the ni nice way, and I, give me the gun just for a year, and I'll have the solution. No, 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 look, uh, this, is, this is far too important to gloss over. I'm not saying any of that stuff. I use the word stuff just in time. <laughs> <laughs> I am not saying anything of the kind. I am trying to to offer you a new way of looking at this problem and to, to demonstrate to you various techniques which are available once you start thinking in those terms and which I have tried out in various ways. Now, one of the things I particularly wanted to say before we left Chile, doomed or otherwise, is that if you are going to avoid technocracy, and now I'm building up to my third chart because we've got to get this pretty fast by now, um, I'm going to Mexico tomorrow. <laughs> no, Where were we? <laughs> um, I do not want you to perceive this as a technological thing because it's not, you know, if you, in fairness to me, look at some of the things I was writing 25 years ago. Do not ask what the computer will do for us. Ask how different are we given that there is a computer? Now, you know, that is the kind of philosophy. So you don't say, well, you've all got to have any algodonic meters. What you say is, oh, we can do this kind of thing. How does he grab you fellas? You know? Now, I mobilized, and this is a thing I very much want to push. I mobilized the people through the artists and the musicians and the painters and all those people. And I said, now let's learn. Now, once those inputs start going into the system, it's amazing. See, have you ever heard of a folklorist who set to music a song I wrote called Litany for a Computer and a Baby About to be Born? <coughs> now, that is, that's, that's true. That was Angel Parra, who's one of the top Chilean folk people. This is the way to proceed. Oh, at least I suspect it is. At least it's something to offer. Instead of the miserable bureaucratic nonsenses we get into now and call this consulting the people. See, somebody puts out a white paper and says, well now, sort that out. Now, who, who here has ever actually read a white paper, you know, properly? What's the thing, sir, that I'm, 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 I'm still concerned about this although from a slightly different perspective, is that I think that if we're going to say the planet is going to require a lot of rational thought, and what you've been saying, what you've been saying, or what you were saying at the beginning of your talk was that in a, in a sense there's a lot of irrationality going on. Uh, I can understand why you want to attack some of the categories that you want to attack in an over-rigid sort of designation of what can be considered and what can't be considered. But what, what, I'm, what I'm concerned about is that I think you're all, you're just about ready to throw the baby, uh, the baby out of the bathwater in the sense that I can see reason going out the window as well. I mean, take the whole question, take the whole question of uh, alternative energy sources, say. I mean, I think there is a viable uh, debate to be had about that. Sure, 
And uh, I'm really not sure where, where the autonomic meters come, <laughs> come into the picture here. And I'm not really sure whether or not one can have that viable debate on the basis of pleasure and pain measurements. I mean, I think that... Uh, I don't want to throw the brain out of the bath. Well, why don't you use the model of Jane, James, you know, the left and right hand brain? Just because I'm using my right hand brain to have a freak out on the music with Ankle Pala doesn't mean to say I can't determine that there are 12 rather than 11 the recursions of the viable system. You know, we don't have to, we don't have to make those choices. We are human beings. I want to restore the human potential here. That's what I'm talking about. Is there danger bringing the technology, uh, technology, technological examples in too much? Because it seems to me the tremendous value of this is understanding that human society is a system. And, 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 and mm. the understanding of those relationships is gigantically important and gigantically realistic and gigantically right. hopeful in the sense. Uh, as an aside, uh, incidentally, uh, the problems that this may raise, put those aside because we have a great resource of problems which we even can illustrate from the appalling abuse of human knowledge which we see all around us. Even from that abuse of knowledge we can see oh, some hint of, but the actual examples yes. all, all often have a very dirty smell about them. I agree. Look. I'm, uh, I'm embarrassed by now about time. Sorry. Uh, let me have a quick stab at this last one, or, or would you rather go home? No. <laughs> um, there are obvious Eastern overtones to this diagram. <laughs> Alan Watts wrote a beautiful sentence where he said, if religion is the opium of the people, <laughs> The Hindus have got the inside dope. <laughs> and I very much agree with that. Hence my cracks at my learned scientific friends in India just now, earlier. There are three components to this model. There is that big thick ring, which is selfhood. What, sorry? Which is selfhood. Now, I don't care, you see, I've said enough about recursions tonight to, to, I hope you feel fairly free with what is a real big paradigm shift. I don't care whether you want to use this model as yourself, or of a community, or of a nation, or of the entire world. What I'm going to say will apply to any recursion you like. It is an identity. It is a recognizable identity, which is this circle. Now, I don't know if you can see instantly, uh, you very likely can, that it is a consequence of Ashby's law of requisite variety, which we were talking about, you know, where the varieties have to balance. It is a consequence of that, which is known as the Conant-Ashby theorem, and is proved mathematically and all that jazz, that a regulatory system is only as good as the model it contains and one has to be regulated. Now, that's obvious, actually. But, you know, we all behave as if it weren't true. <laughs> we think we know. And that's why we get into the problems like saying he is not himself. I don't understand my son. You know? Your model's no good. Of course you don't understand him. It has not enough variety and it's, it's all wrong anyway. Now, the regulation of the self must obey, at every level of recursion, Ashby's theorem. Look at your physical body. Why is my arm not wobbling around all over the place? Because I haven't got ataxia, which is a pathological condition. My nervous system is adequate, just about, to, to, uh, to keep me under some sort of control. Now, that's the Conant-Ashby theorem, and that is providing that there is enough of a model of the world in which my body has to behave inside my nervous system, namely my brain, that I can operate in it. I see that it's there and therefore I am able to pick it up. Now that applies in society too, because if we understand well enough how society works, then the Conant-Ashby theorem says, well, we must penetrate that with a quote-unquote nervous system, namely a, an information setup 
which will regulate that piece of society we are considering. In other words, you can't catch criminals if you're the police unless you've got some information. You can't put up fires if you're in the fire service. Now, what this says is that the Conant Ashby theorem says that inside that self, there is a nervous system, with, with or without quotes, depending on what you're dealing with. Now, what happens outside that? There is another level of action where we try and get into things, which is this circle, with its nice nine dots on it, where we're not quite sure if our nervous system or our regulatory system at all, at any level of recursion, will actually work. So we say, well, I think I'll take up painting. And we go, plum, plum, plum. We go, crap, that's terrible. That's terrible. <laughs> I haven't been taught to paint, for God's sake. So you see, these lines aren't quite making it. But you can be taught to paint. And if society can't deliver what it wants to deliver by way of uh, services to the people in answer to the will of the people, they will have to develop adequate models. Now, we don't do this, you see. We particularly don't do it in economics. We don't have adequate uh, uh, representations of what the economy is doing. They lack requisite variety. So I'm not arguing, you see, about whether Dr. Boggs or Professor uh, somebody else's theory is better. I'm just saying none of them have requisite variety. They cannot answer to Conan Ashby. Trouble. So the first level we can cope with, because we've got it, the second level is where we're stretching out and could get it, and all our policies should be directed to making these lines stretch out so that they, they can do what, what is within our grasp. And then if you ask me what the next one is, well, obviously, it is what Aristotle called entelechy, and I've put it on the diagram. It is, it is the ability to fulfill the wholeness of the self. Now, in personal terms, this is a mystical concept, if, if you will, or even if you won't. It is the notion that one can expand one's, oneself to fill a larger space. And if you were a good Buddhist, you would say the whole universe. Because it doesn't matter to a Buddhist whether he fills the entire universe or disappears into a grain of sand. Society-wise, you've got the same thing. What is a caring society? How far can we go along the road, or do we wish to go along the road, of behaving in a completely loving way, which I would take to be the analogue. So this diagram, bless its little heart, you see, is meant to do, as the caption says, for the discussion of social cybernetics under these three notions, that there is a self which has to preserve its identity and must have adequate regulatory power, that that can be extended by learning and development and deliberate regulatory extension, and thirdly, that there is something beyond that which we barely intuit, but we do intuit. So that's it, and if you go back to the first map then, see, what I'm really saying to this gentleman here, sorry, not knowing names is awkward, um, I'm saying what Jung said, that really we can only make the progression by changing our person personal selves. And if that doesn't sound like an answer to a planet doom, too bad. But really, it is the only practical thing any one person can do. Aren't our personal, so personal selves formed within the system, the social system? You're treating the self as something. No, I'm not. I'm, me. I'm, I'm treating it, as I said, I treat it as a recursion within another larval system. You, you've, got a, you, you've got part of this diagram which actually contains the secret about which you haven't said very much because if that represents the world and these are countries mm. or that re represents the village and these are castes or a country and their uh, Northern Ireland and their religions, isn't it that triangular job 
that does the smoothing out mm. of the oscillations. Can you tell us what that actually consists of? Because isn't that the thing that's going to do the trick? Isn't that the thing that, that prevents one half from gaining um, everything at the expense yes. of the other? Well, it ought to be. Now, inside the body, it's, uh, that is quite specifically in my, my work, the uh, sympathetic nervous system. And in society, it's a, kind of, it's a kind of regulatory thing which people accept as not impinging on their freedom. Now, the best example I know of this is in a manufacturing company, that would be a production control function. It says, look, I don't want to stop you making all those things, old chap, but the fact is that you won't have stocking space, you see, because you're going to interact with everybody else. And that works very well. Another nice example, because it shows that it doesn't really subtract from freedom, is a, is a school timetable. See, where, where if you want to change your lesson, well, it's going to, you know, it's going to imp impact on him. And the, the timetable is a piece of machinery which enables you to... Uh, to avoid going into an uncontrolled oscillation and having all the pupils trying to get into one room and all the, all the teachers uh, off on the same afternoon, see? So those are, those are examples. Now, world level, you see, I find it impossible to get away from the UN as, as this kind of thing. Now, Yendi trusted the UN, went and made a most marvellous speech there, and everybody said, by God, you're right, we can't have this. It did nothing. So we're very, very imperfect. Now, if you look at the physiological version of this model, if you have no system four or five and only have a three, two, one, you've got a reactive, crisis-oriented, decerebrate cat is what you've got. Peg down on the table. You can keep it alive. You can prod it. It waggles its limbs in answer. And that's where we're at at the international level. And as the manipulation, see, I had an altercation with Mr. Menachem Begin, Begin about this in April, just before he invaded uh, Lebanon. Those people are move, were moving so fast that nobody in the United Nations, you know, they could be forgiven for not knowing which country they were talking about because they kept, they were keep, kept getting resolutions to say, stop it. You know, there were about six going on at once. Well, now that is very clever cybernetics again. That Be Begin said to me, don't you worry about nuclear war. Wars will be fast and over before anybody can say stop it. And two, two weeks later, he was into Lebanon. Well, that actually <laughs> happened. And, and, you know, that's the clever way to proceed. Because then you treat... UN as a, as a decerebrate cat. Now, how we can stop that, I don't know. I don't know any of the answers to this, but I have really tried to lay out some tools in front Isn't of you. Isn't a real picture, though, that says that this is a model of the brain, which is okay, but as a model of the real world, I mean, there's a lot of conflict that goes on in the real world, which I don't think is reflected in this so-called viral system. Well, it is, because uh, the varieties, you see, I haven't had time to go into that in detail. The, the varieties generated in those loops have all to be matched. There are several hundred loops implicit in that diagram, all of which have to be, have their conflicts resolved in terms of Ashby's uh, requisite variety law. So, so it does Sometimes reflect. These conflicts are irreconcilable. Oh yes, you well, assume, you may argue that the conflicts are reconcilable within certain situations. No, if they're, an if they're irreconcilable, you've got a pathological state. Now, I use this model mainly for diagnostic purposes. And if I'm consulting to a company, it works like a charm, you see. You can see, you say after about four days, usually, you know, what is wrong here is that system two is in too, too informal and system four barely exists, and only as that doesn't work, system five's collapsed into system three, but on. What you have to do is the following. Well, that is, that is precisely to recognize a pathological state. My problem is not to do that, which I can do, and I'm just doing about the UN. The problem is, what, what, how do you do anything about it? Is, is, sorry, to, to go on. But it, is one of the characteristics of the system, too, that it, in, in hierarchical terms, is superior to the circles and squares, and therefore its will goes? Well, you see, it mustn't be if it's only anti-oscillatory. Like, it should be as neutral as the timetable. But, of course, the trouble is, 
I was a production controller once myself in the steel industry, and everybody said, who is this young man telling me what to do? You really got that problem. I do agree. Now, you should mention that it's really a device for handling undecidability, perhaps, because that resolves the ethical dilemma once and for all, surely. Yes, it should. When you as an autonomous entity can no longer proceed because your, your policy is broken down, then you, you are learning, seeking, finding, help me, help me, I, I don't know what to do next. And you say, well, there is a formal structure, it's the next system, yeah. and you go up a level. But is that fair? Yes. See, the next level of recursion is always the meta system of the one below. Someone was using that word. That's quite right. You, um, you introduced, on top of this objective model, your value system. In simple terms, you said nice and nasty, mm -hmm. which I uh, approve of as a simple business moral philosophy. Uh, and um, the dictator is nasty, and the people is nice. Uh, you, you simply assume that. Um, I'm wondering whether perhaps you'd be willing to suggest that really there is a natural algorithmic process going on whereby when the system is functioning so badly they have to call in an outside consultant before the business goes bust like you. Equally, it, it's the, the pressure of the pain. I mean that you don't need a moral or ethical system to tell you that uh, a system which doesn't have feedback to the will of the people is bad. It simply is showing itself to be normal. Now, uh, I don't know, your, your model of, of the consultant called in by big business or by IMD may not be the only, the only model of how System 5 is rejected as well. No, well, that's raising. true. That's true, but um, most of the world is starving and most of the world is being tortured by the boss, so... Okay, it's a value judgment. Oh, yeah, I... <laughs> Rick Fulman, I think, has quite a lot to say about being and having and all of these kind of things that you were coming on to. Who does? Eric Fromm. Eric Fromm. Oh, yes, surely. And I think yeah. for anyone that hasn't read one of his books, um, say, to have or to being or having on this subject, can't really get the concept of that inner circle, mm. perhaps. Perhaps so. That's a nice beginning. I've dealt with it very fast. May, may, I say, may I say, if I had an algodonic meter in front of me now, I think it would be reading about halfway, and I wouldn't know how to interpret it unless I, <laughs> unless I felt that half of our hearts were that we want to proceed all night long, but the other half was telling us that uh, the other demands on us were, were uh, calling, us, uh, calling us away, and that Stafford uh, has, an, uh, out of uh, concern, that uh, Stafford has been been uh, leading us through this uh, intellectual journey for the last two and a half hours. That really is about as much as uh, is appropriate for one one evening. So, but but yet I would have a problem in deciphering it. So I'm 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 going to assume that the uh, really what we, I would have to interpret that uh, the, the latter was was the case, and that hopefully though some some time uh, in the in the uh, in the, in, in the in the not too distant future, there would be some opportunity to follow up this discussion in, in some way, um, so that uh, all the uh, the variety that we've uh, that we've developed this evening uh, could be uh, harnessed uh, in a productive way. I'd I'd like to thank Stafford very much uh, for 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 having this uh, chat with us and. Uh, he